should go. I mean, we already got somebody in there. Good morning. Hey, we are early. You can't rush us when we're early. Uh, we also have some beer to try. Yeah. I'll, yeah. yeah. It's good to have my base beer and then, you know. Then, then get into it. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> Let us know how we are sounding. <clears throat> Crispy <clears throat> and delicious. <clears throat> All right. Get that face in my mouth. Well, uh, right next to my face. Welcome everybody, and uh, for all of you who are in here early, you're going to get the joke of the week. Uh, what do you call a uh, T-Rex that is a uh, gun dealer? Uh, a dinosaur. <laughs> Nailed it. Small arms dealer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, little bit of humor to start you off with, you know, so we'll, uh, we'll you are right welcome people. You are welcome. Yeah, definitely welcome for all of this, all of this gloriousness. Let us know if you guys got, you guys have some jokes. We can read them off during the, yeah, the you almost got it. Here. Short arms dealer. I mean, you were almost there short, small, like so close, so close, but, uh, Scott got it. Scott got it. Strip it down, joke of the week, bump, 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 joke of the week. All right, looks like uh, looks like we're getting set up. We're almost at 45. Get people in there. Make sure we're looking good, tasting good. Everyone, let us know how we're tasting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming everything's going on well. Uh, Great. It's not quite 8.45 yet, so, you know, we'll just do a little bit of banter. A little bit of, a little, little, little bit of banter uh, on there. Uh, oh. Tomorrow, are we going uh, downtown tomorrow? Hopefully. Hopefully, okay. Well, that'll be good. We're, we're gonna do a nice uh, big batch with, uh, with our friends or with our friends? With our friends, I still have yet to confirm. So okay. I, gotta, I gotta text, shoot out some texts. I wanted to make sure that we can get everything transferred over today if we we're gonna make that yeah, happen, so. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's what's happening there. Are you going down there today? Uh, probably, slash, okay. I believe so. Maybe, uh, could you uh, stop by Wisconsin Burger to drop off some soda cakes? Yeah, I can do that. Sweet. Uh, we are the official soda of Wisconsin Burger here in Spokane. If you haven't eaten, eaten their burgers, you should. And uh, drive here to drink our beer and then eat their burgers because they're delicious. Are the friends going in the mash or the boil? Uh, we usually like to uh, just mash our friends. Nah. Um, that's where you get the best extraction and breakdown, uh, yeah. especially when we throw some pineapple in there to get that uh, protease. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we'll just you'll mill it through with the grains, though. That way, yeah. you know, you get the good breakdown. Um, I like my gap set pretty thin, so I get a nice fine crush on my, my friends. Yeah. And that also uh, has a double bonus of prehydrating your grist. That's right. Um, all right. I believe we, well, it's 846 now, so we are good to go. Welcome everybody to the Genus Brewing live stream. This is a live stream we do every single Sunday morning at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time in the morning a.m. And uh, the format of this goes, we break down some Genus Brewing or otherwise be your news in the area. Then we go into a style of the week where we give you a BJCP rundown of what goes into a certain style of beer and give you our favorite malt, hops, and yeast, which we might have to make up on this one. I don't think I added that. Uh, no, you didn't, but... Yeah, we can figure there, it out. There's some, there's some good ones in there. And then we go into two discussion topics. So today's discussion topic is going to be what different water minerals add to your beer. Um, so talk about all the different things that uh, you've seen in water chemistry, but maybe don't know exactly what each of them are doing. And then we'll uh, hopefully get to the one that we skipped over last week, which is how to scale your brewing recipes, especially if you're going from a homebrew size all the way up to a commercial beer size. You guys out there opening breweries, it's going to be valuable information. So okay. let's get into the Genus Brewing news. Oh, there we go. I lost a chat for a minute. That was that was concerning. Where did the right. other guy go, Lowell? Which other guy? There's been like 40,000 people on the show. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a good question. 
if you're talking about the other regular on the show, then go back and watch some of the other live streams, particularly the one labeled Logan's Last Day. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, Genus Brewing News. We got a new Hazy on tap. Pretty excited about that one. A uh, little experimental. We used uh, Barber Rouge hops in there, as well as uh, African XJA2s. Uh, slash some other number that I don't remember um, and fermented it out with sundew really trying to push forward some more berry flavors out of these guys instead of the traditional like tropical juiciness and let me tell you it is very delicious uh, it definitely <laughs> is it's pretty awesome I mean you're still getting your classic uh, juiciness coming out of it but there's some really nice spiciness in there yeah uh, for those of you who don't know sundew we went over that in a video about omega yeast that uses the crispr cas9 system to uh, delete the gene for producing four vinyl guayacol which is that clove gene and so it is a belgian abbey strain um, so it's got some nice fruitiness from the belgian abbiness but without that pungence that comes from the four vinyl guayacol so a really fun strain to try out and things like ipas or even wheat beers yeah definitely uh, it's a delicious strain, a delicious beer. I recommend experimenting with it. Yeah, uh, we went ahead and brewed up a tropical stout. Uh, tropical stout, for those of you who don't know, we have done a live stream breakdown on what those are. Uh, but basically, they're a softer, sweeter version of a stout. Uh, and they have some subtle fruitiness, which comes from fermenting with a lager yeast at a warm temperature. Yeah, uh, taking the tropical stout to heart, uh, we threw a little bit of a spin on there. Uh, threw a tiny bit of Sabro in there to push some of those uh, coconut as well as tropical flavors and really kind of make that impression that this, you know, comes from an island, belongs, uh, belongs in the tropics. Yeah, and really want to, you know, make a beer that when you drink it makes you think, Sabro. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, we have uh, uh, the newest batch of hard seltzers is also in the works. Uh, we're going to be doing a five barrel batch of that so we can split off into a bunch of different flavoring components. Um, and then hopefully to go along with that, we will be able to uh, do a smaller batch of seltzer to kind of show you our specific how we make our hard seltzers in-house and how awesome they work. And to do so, we have some fun new toys from uh, Keg King, which is different than Keg Land. Used to be the same company, split off into two. Uh, Keg Land is the one that you see making uh, the like the whatever the Robo Brew turned into, and they've got like the Firmzilla and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, Keg King has their own offshoot of those similar styles of fermenters, um, but they sent us a couple of their pressure fermenters, which will be being released in America very very soon, if not already. And I'm super excited to try them. Man, they'll be uh, really fun. Along ago with, <coughs> excuse me, along. To go along with that, because I can talk quite well. Talking is uh, overrated. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, we're having a great new company <laughs> move in close to us that's going to help us out with the seltzers, <laughs> some uh, side hustle syrups. Uh, Dylan's been in here a few times, you know, definitely getting his hustle on uh, with uh, flavors. They do some really awesome things. And uh, he's going to work with us for some really fun flavors. Question of the day. Do you care if your hard seltzer is low calorie as long as it tastes good? I'm going to leave that one to all of you because we might be making some high calorie hard seltzers. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Hayden chimed in about Logan. Logan is off doing some fishing. Um, Logan, yeah, the, the yeah. guy that was part of uh, the regular live streams. Uh, when did he leave? January. Um... Well, he was on like He's on one in February. His last one was in February. Yeah, he did one in February. Yeah, but yeah he uh, um, he is no longer with the company. He uh, uh, made the decision to go spend more time with his family, which is admirable. Um, uh, you got two little kids, and they're not going to be little for forever. So you want to really take that family time and make the best of it. So um, yeah. he's doing that. Good on him. Um, and uh, yeah. He's also got a fishing YouTube channel, so go dorsal, watch that. Yeah, dorsal fishing. I think he has two videos out so far, so he's trying to push that. Um, yeah, give him go, some love. Go support him. Say, hi, Logan, we miss you. Ask him some beer questions on his fishing channel just to confuse everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also some beard questions, both. Yeah. Beer and beard questions. Beer in <laughs> beard questions. Like, yeah. Can you pull it out and hold it like a soup bowl and then drink out of your beard? Or is there a way to braid your beard into a koozie? So that you kind of always have cold beer ready to go at your sipping. Like a six pack koozie. You know, so <laughs> you could just pull one out or you just go down the line and then lean back. All right. We're getting derailed. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah. I, think that, I think that's it for our, for our genius brewing news. If you've got questions on any of that stuff, go ahead and throw them out in the comments. But now it's time for the 
Beer of the week. Bum, bum, bum. Beer of the week. Beer. And today's beer of the week is going to be the Goza style uh, 27A in BJCP uh, guidelines. I like this one uh, comment. Hard seltzer with electrolytes. Oh, we should. So actually, yes. so yes. And we can probably get into a lot more of why when we talk about, about what minerals add to beer later. We'll, we'll bring but, uh, this up later. Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll add when we're talking about minerals. We'll go into some of that and maybe even add some minerals that I didn't even list. Yeah, there we go. Uh, all right, Gosa. Uh, Gosa. Gosa is a pretty cool beer. I mean, th this beer actually died out for a while. It was not produced for uh, quite a few years. Uh, what was that? That's on my second page. Uh, Seized entirely in 1966, and modern production was revived in the 1980s, 80s. but it really didn't become repopularized, I wouldn't say, until the late 2000, like 2010, something like that. Yeah. We started to see it pop back up, you know, in, in a more commercial yeah. and widespread sense. Yeah. Uh, and this is a phenomenal beer. I'm, I'm stoked that it's back. Uh, overall impression on that, this is going to be a really highly carbonated, tart uh, fruity wheat ale. Uh, you should have very little coriander and very little salt, almost no bitterness, low to no bitterness in there. Super refreshing, super bright flavors in that. Um, and I think one thing we want to point out here is the low restrained character of the salt and coriander. Most of the time in modern day renditions, you see a, the coriander falling way to fruit. So maybe not even as much that one, but the salt. Yeah. Uh, Salt on this is actually past the flavor threshold. It's the only style I think where uh, specifically being past the flavor threshold of salt is uh, style appropriate. That said, mm -hmm. it's not quite to the point where it is uh, salty. Uh, yeah, and it, it's one of uh, we have had quite pleasant salty uh, gosas. In fact, the one that we drank a couple of live streams ago was definitely on the high end for a gosa. But oh man, that was so good, done in the right way. Yeah, you don't want it. You don't want it to taste like seawater, but you want it to be like, oh yeah, that tastes like, like it's got the. It's more like the rim on a margarita glass, kind of salty. Like mm -hmm. you, it gives you that extra um, depth of, of of maltiness, and yeah. that's also why I brought up the topic that we're going to be talking about, which is the minerals in beer, because it's got some, some fun characteristics yes, that happens when you put in uh, some salt and some beer. So what does this beer smell like? Uh, aroma on this is going to be, uh, it's a light to moderately fruity aroma. Uh, they say of palm fruit, don't know exactly what that means. Uh, but basically what you want out of this is you want some yeast characteristic, that standard um, German yeast driven fruitiness. And so it's not pungent, it's not like a UK yeast pungent fruitiness, but it's like a, a soft, light, I guess whatever palm fruit smells like fruitiness. Um, light sourness, uh, a little bit sharp on the nose, and obviously you do want some of that spice and almost oranginess that you can get off of coriander. Um, other than that, it's going to be you know, uh, a relatively light, it's going to smell like a wheat beer with a little bit of saltiness and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of spice. Yeah, uh, I would say the fruitiness is kind of akin to uh, Kolsch fruitiness that you get off of uh, yeast for that. Um, you mm -hmm. know, just that nice, light, delicate German fruitiness. Uh, I, I was almost thinking the palm fruit was a uh, typo and it should say some. But some fruit, yeah, I maybe. don't. I mean, this is, this is, is copy paste. <laughs> All right, BJCP, <laughs> get your act together. Is this real? I mean, <laughs> come on, son. P O M E. Someone asked if it was palm, P A L M, uh, for, like no, coconut. No. no, it's P O M E. Um, someone looked that up and tell me what palm fruit's supposed to smell like. Uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Biha, actually, banana. That's a good uh, question. I, I'm assuming that he's asking about the classic German Hefeweizen or German wheat beer banana character. Uh, and on Not so much on the banana. Uh, I mean, if, if it's slightly there, that's okay. And it could add to the bouquet that you're going to be getting off of that. Um, but it's not going to be, it's, uh, you know, Hefeweizen yeast is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other soft kind of, I, we just know it as brewers, we just know it as German fruitiness. Uh, I'm sorry, we memorize flavors a lot differently than <laughs> a lot of you out there. We try our best to uh, to circle back and try to, you know, relate it to something that's more familiar to a lot of you guys. But we just know it as a oh, pom is an apple. Mm, like pom, like the French pom. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, actually, pom is a great way to describe this. Uh, it's the uh, green apple flavor that can uh, come off. Uh, it's, I always call it acetaldehyde. He's going to correct me. Acetal acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde are technically both correct. Um, uh, so it's the, 
yeah. nomenclature you learn in chemistry. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> oh, but that's what they're talking about. And this is kind of the fruitiness that they're talking about, in my opinion. Uh, when I think German fruitiness, especially like Bavarian Hefeweizen, it's just that light touch of Granny Smith apple skin on it. And I absolutely love that. And I think that's uh, highly appropriate in this beer. That, that's a good German fruitiness to kind of think about green apple skin. I would also add like a little bit of apple blossom kind of smell. Is it going to yeah. be appropriate too? Just a little bit of, uh, for me, it's just blanket German fruitiness in the back of my mind, but it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, appearance on this is going to be unfiltered. And so these, uh, these goes are going to be hazy um, from the proteins from the wheat. Um, usually they're done with a higher degree of, of uh, under modified malts. Um, and uh, they're going to have some high protein content. That's part of what makes these a nice hearty beer and actually a really good beer to drink if you're uh, doing a beer fast. Um, mm -hmm. That's where you don't eat any food. You just drink beer for 30 days. And uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of proteins in them. So it's going to be hazy, moderate to tall sized white head, again, from the proteins and some starches. Um, with tight bubbles and good retention. This is going to be a highly carbonated beer as well. Um, the more carbonation you get, the more you're going to bring out the subtleness that comes from that German fruitiness, and the more you're going to be able to experience uh, a lot from the um, natural fermentation that comes from the lactic acid. And this is also supposed to be a highly refreshing and quaffable beer. You should be able to drink this pretty speedily, and the, the carbonation is definitely going to help that uh, bright refreshing quality yeah you're gonna be able to pound a lot of it very very fast maybe not chug because of the carbonation but uh you know sip after sip after sip good to go uh, when it comes to flavor moderate to restrain but noticeable sourness uh it's gonna be um so lactic acid is a unique sourness that i like to describe as the sweet sour it's the mm -hmm. sour that actually tastes a little bit sweet on your tongue um a lot of people say it's like lemon but for me it's like lemon but without the if you take a bite of a lemon uh like a lemon wedge then you got that face scrunching sourness and lactic acid doesn't give you quite that lactic acid for me it doesn't hit me right about here on the palate uh, where other acids hit you more in the throat and it's kind of almost like a, a, an instant mouth water lactic acid tends to uh, be very soft and mid palate for me it doesn't have that immediate scrunchy scrunch uh, and also on this one, a moderate to restrained sourness. This, this is a tart beer, uh, not a full blown sour. We're, uh, a lot of modern renditions, I would say, are over soured for the style. 100%. I mean, for myself, I absolutely love that because I love acid in beers. It is mm, delicious. I can get some over acidified beers, but a lot of those would technically fall into the American sour category. Mm -hmm. um, we did the same thing with sours that we did with IPAs. We took them and turned them up to 11. <laughs> That's exactly true. And, and truly, for a nice gosa, uh, this should be pretty much on the borderline of tart and sour right in there and it should be more refreshing sour than pucker sour most definitely mm -hmm. um uh overall characteristic okay. ingredients uh pilsner and wheat malt um obviously we got the salt in there uh it's good to go with a sea salt um classic florida sal or himalayan salt both going to be appropriate i wouldn't go with anything iodized obviously um and then i wouldn't go um I just I would steer clear of cheap salts as much as, uh, you know, they're probably fine. If it says sea salt, you're good to go. Yeah. Um, iodine, uh, I've actually seen this uh, in a few different things. Uh, the iodized salt, if you add too much of it, it can inhibit uh, both bacterial as well as yeast growth in there. But more importantly, the way that it works out in your beer when it all ferments out, it gives you a really bad taste it, it tastes like a doctor's office tastes that clean sterile medical ness to it and you know what sea salt just use sea salt it's cheap enough next to the table salt don't skimp out on this don't think you're gonna be okay because you're gonna end up with a plasticky beer yeah it's yeah it's gonna or some metallic is how a lot of people describe it yeah uh salad afficico afficico sal let me know how I pronounce that. I'm guessing I got it at 100% right. Um, <laughs> just brewed a kettle soured goza with coriander, lime zest, uh, and lime juice, and kefir, kefir lime leaves, uh, and a kilo of cucumbers in the fermenter. 4.1%. Uh, you used a uh, scar quike, which I haven't used before. 4.1%. Uh, that sounds really good. Um, the, the kefir lime leaves yeah. uh, and the cucumbers for the freshness. Cucumbers. Oof. Oh, man. That's going to be great. 
like the uh, cucumbers especially in sours is super delicious except yeah. for 10 barrel crush that tastes like barf yeah well, that, nobody should drink it that just has to do with how they brew it though yeah i know um someone's asking what did i just see uh what's oh. what about an imperial goza imperial goza is going to be an american sour it's going to be more sour than you think you want it to be because of how the sugars are going to be present probably um it's just going to be different if an imperial goza you're making trace agave mas agave mas, mas agave mas agave well, all right, so Masagavi is a it's little bit beer. different now. Uh, Founders made an Imperial Gosa that was aged in tequila barrels with lime and salt and coriander, all the goodness. It was amazing. They do actually now make a uh, Masagave seltzer. Um, mm. So we're not talking about the seltzer. We're talking about their Imperial Gosa, and it was delicious. I support the idea. Go for it. Just keep in mind that uh, you are taking some of the things away from this beer, being the extreme drinkability of it, uh, as well as you are going to up the sour a little bit. Yeah, which just, I'm good with. Just it's just that's this is one of those things that like you know if you make an imperial porter, I'm like ah it's still a porter. You make an imperial goza, to me it's just a different beer. Uh, let's talk about the vital statistics about uh, on this one. Um, it's going to be 4.2 to 4.8 ABV. So a goza is designed to be a session uh, beer, and usually going to be a high uh, protein session beer. Final gravity between 1006 and 1010, so it's still pretty light and dry. But again, you want that nice tight head. Um, gonna come from the protein matrix. You get, get a lot of high protein malts. Um, and that pretty much covers it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to go into the history of this a little bit because uh, this is bothering me slightly. Uh, BJCP has on it a minor style associated with uh, Lips Lipzig. Lipzig. Uh, but. <laughs> Like, why would you do this? The, okay, the real history of this is that this town is, a, it, it comes from the middle, or sorry, this beer comes from a town in the Middle Ages known as Gosler on the Gosa River. So that's where it comes from and gets its name from. And it's delicious. Yeah, so they start out with Leipzig, like, but uh, yeah, it, okay, that's where it actually Documents comes from. have been in there. So somebody copied this it from Leipzig. I just got mad and didn't read the whole thing. Uh, okay. But darn it, it's from Gosler. <laughs> All right, we, uh, so on that, I saw a couple of good uh, things in here. Um, There's one question saying if the lactic acid, if the sourness comes from lactic acid, not yes. acid producing yeast. Uh, it does not come from acid producing yeast traditionally. It comes from acid producing bacteria, um, specifically lactobacillus uh, and uh, Ycelium. Why, what's, the, what's that one called? Y something. Um, but traditionally, uh, so the the thing that makes yogurt and the thing that is naturally occurring on, um, you know, on the outside of malts, on the outside of uh, like like garlic, if you do naturally fermented foods, um, acid producing bacteria makes lactic acid as the dominant acid. Um, more uh, old world examples, so like the original examples, uh, often included Brett that doesn't say anything about that on this because we've kind of taken the style and refined it a little bit um mm -hmm. uh and they also usually had a mixed culture that was symbiotic and created something similar to a scoby and the original examples actually were bottled in these long bottles where during fermentation the uh the krausen or whatever the uh um, what or it basically was the scoby from the from the mixed culture would go into the long thin neck of the bottles and it would form its own natural cork which is kind of a fun little history and og gozos which i would love to try to do that'd be yeah, really fun i think fun. we should try and do that yeah. honestly it'd be awesome look these things up they're really cool yeah. i mean it's this big vessel and then it narrows down into a neck that's like yay wide it's yeah. so cool and just the natural yeast and bacteria i'm gonna call it a scoby because the best thing i can relate it to dries up in the neck and turns into a cork super fun yeah uh thomas thank you, oh thomas. thank you so much love yeah. this sunday beer school thanks guys have one on me hey i appreciate that thomas definitely uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy had a uh, great question about this. Would pink salt or more expensive salts provide additional flavors uh, in something like a Goza where salt is used in heavier amount than most? And the answer is yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, pink Him uh, Himalayan pink salt. Uh, I've seen uh, black Himalayan salts uh, used. Uh, but yeah, it does pro provide an extra dimension. So if you're just using classic sea salts, um, it's going to come across one note it will be a little bit more complex. I don't know if you can specifically say that you're going to be able to notice the difference side by side, but um, I will you say, might be able to. I will say it depends on the salt in there uh, and what it is. Um, I've experimented with this a little bit. Uh, so if you're using something like Alea or uh, Hawaiian red salt, it definitely is more heavily earthy because of the clay that's on there. 
Uh, also, one of the best gosas that I've ever made was 100% because of the salt. The restaurant that I worked at the, uh, at the time uh, cured some lemons in salt, then dried it all back out, as well as Ooh. some other spices. Dried That's it all really back good. out and crumbled it back into salt. And uh, there's coriander and nice. Uh, I think there was uh, some cardamom in there, the lemons, and it was just this beautifully spiced lemon salt, and it made 100% of the difference. It was incredible. Reverend K. Y. says, you, you sound smart, but if you shaved down to a mustache, you'd be as smart as me. That's probably true. <laughs> Most of the wisdom is held in the beard. <laughs> it, it, you know, you're too fascinated looking at the beard to listen to the full words. It, uh, uh, salad Faccio. I'm guessing that's uh, your name is now Salad Faccio. I don't know if that's that's how it's pronounced. Uh, favorite lactobacillus strain to use in a goza? Uh, Bucneri for flavor, 100%. Um, Plantarum though is the most versatile lactobacillus strain. Plantarum is IBU tolerant, meaning it's not going to die to a decent amount of hops. If the, not that they're in a goza anyway, but if they are for whatever reason, uh, Plantarum is not going to die to them. I think it's good up to 35 IBUs. Um, and Plantarum produces great flavors with very little, if not any risk of uh, butyric acid at a wide temperature range. That means if you ferment it at 70 degrees the entire way, um, plantarum will still produce nice, clean lactic acid. And uh, Logan says it tastes a little bit yogurty and it does have a different flavor than bukneri. I like bukneri, bukneri for raw flavor, but plantarum is the hardiest and easiest to use to create a great flavor. I, so. would, I would say that plantarum's flavor, uh, it it's very soft compared to every uh, all the other lactic acid producers that mm -hmm. I've had. Really soft, forgiving, and easy on there. Um, and for those of you who have this question, uh, butyric acid smells like barf, literal barf. Uh, it's the same acid that comes out of your gallbladder or that's in bile. So it's normally described as baby barf, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, if anybody has this problem and you produced a bunch of it, throw as many different strains of Brett at it as you can. Uh, Brett can sometimes metabolize this acid into a couple of other things uh, and clean it up or at least take it down to a tolerable level. But other than that, uh, if you have it, you're stuck with it. Uh, plenty of people uh, saying that uh, crystal malt is definitely appropriate in this. And I agree, if you could do 100% crystal malt goza, that is that's the way to go, for sure. Um, mm. For those of you who are watching this or listening to this on the podcast, I don't like crystal malt, and so that was a lie. I feel yeah. like I need to say that. I feel like there's a number of times that I've been like, yeah, I use crystal malt, and people don't know that people, I'm joking. People don't know you're joking half the time, and that has you know, gotten several of them into trouble. That's yeah, that's true. <laughs> like I need if, to if he says something that you're like, no, that doesn't sound right. Don't believe it because it's probably not true. Yeah, I need to get better at like emoting my voice a little bit more. <laughs> right. Uh, Let's go into our favorite uh, mall tops and yeast really quick on this. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, Reverend was actually talking about you. Yeah, I yeah I read that. Yeah, because yeah. I shaved off the mustache. mustache. I would sound I would sound super smart if uh, yeah. I had my mustache back. Uh, fair enough. Fair fair enough. Um, actually, yeast and the beast brute gosa. Uh, that's an interesting to bring thing to bring up in that if you're doing the gosa right, it should be pretty brute like. It should be pretty down. Or it should, sorry. It should be down pretty far in its final uh, gravity. It's not going to have any extra sugars. The thing that I don't know is super possible is breaking down those proteins and trying to get it down to 1.000. Oh, yeah. Because you need that, you know, like that. So you need that head retention from the proteins. I don't know if those are break downable. Yeah. But goza with Philly sour, technically not going to be a goza. Philly sour, it does have some interesting yeast flavors that go along with the fact that it produces lactic acid. So uh, it's. I'm 50-50. I wouldn't call it a goza, but you can make some good beer out of that. Mm. Uh, and you can salt it post-fermentation, post too. Yeah. Um, let's go on to our favorite malts. Let's uh, yeah. let's keep, keep this thing moving. Keep this thing going. All right. Uh, we are drinking some uh, Japanese rice lager from uh, Brett Ridley. Um, this is uh, this is really nice. It smells fantastic. This. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite delicious. That clarity is brilliant. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, they did use carapels in it, so that was a mistake. Other than that, everything sounds pretty good. Uh, beyond that, it's a uh, 
you know, crystal malt. Uh, I would say the only reason that that's a mistake is you're adding too much body to a beer that should be just Zero. shockingly Mel. like dry and delicious. But and the motu, so this uh, the Japanese rice lager. Speaking of getting off track, this Japanese ri- rice lager made with uh, pilsner flaked rice and carapils. Um, pilsner and flaked rice is all you need. Maybe a little acid malt. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carapils is never going to give you flavor, so that's, I'm always just like, why is that in there? Um, but this is a very well, very tasty beer. The hops in this is Motueka, and that kind of like lemon lime flavor um, on the hops makes this beer just immediately, when I get it close to my face, perceive bright and f- perceive like if this was like a high carb, super effervescent beer, I'd be like, oh, it's Bud mm-hmm. Light, Bud Light lime without the bad lime, and you know, tasty. Delicious. It's really good. Yeah. All right. So favorite malt, I'm gonna go with Torrified Wheat. What are your thoughts? Uh, favorite malt for this? Yeah, for a Goza. Uh, you know, torrefied wheat, or uh, I would even say uh, unmalted wheat in there. But if it's going to be the favorite malt, the malt that I can't change, it's probably going to be a really nice Pilsner malt. Like, I don't yeah. think I, I could do a Goza without a good Pilsner malt. Yeah, that's true. Do you have a favorite brand that you, you want to throw out there? I mean, we use Best Malts a lot. I really, really enjoy Best Malts. They have a great product. Actually, I take that back. Viking Extra Pale could make a very interesting Gosa, but yeah, I think it would it. be a little bit more malty than a tri- traditional Gosa yeah. on that. But I would, the, yeah. The, my favorite Pilsner malt is Heidelberg, but I don't think Heidelberg is necessarily appropriate. Uh, I, actually, I could, I could take that back. I could see Heidelberg if you use that and then you used, you know, let's say 30% malted wheat and then you used a good percentage of... Uh, of torrified wheat because it's got that extra toasty kind of quality, that bready toastiness. Yeah. Um, and the torrified wheat's going to give you the high protein because it's unmalted. So the torrified wheat could be a really good thing. And even if you have a super light base like Heidelberg, yeah, you'll get the character that you need. Yeah. It, it's just such a fine line in this of getting enough malt character out of it, but not taking over. Yeah, beer. it's focusing on the fermentation. It's focusing on the lactic acid. A Goza style is, and uh, if you yeah, if you go with too much malt character in your base, then you're you're gonna kind of lose the purpose of the beer. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd say the biggest thing about malts for me in this would be keeping that really good grain raw flavor into it. Yeah, you want that high protein. Um, that's gonna come from both Heidelberg and torrefied wheat. Um, and any good p- Pilsner malt. Pilsner malt is basically slightly less malted pale malt. Yeah, um, it, it has a more grainy than malty flavor, and that's why I think it, it's really good in this. Yeah. Favorite hops in a Goza? doesn't matter. You can wave some hops nearby it and then just kind of throw them away. I don't put hops in a Goza. So mo- uh, here's one of the reasons why. Most lactobacillus, which you are relying on for the acid to do it right, right, uh, dies at almost any IBU. Um, like Peter said, plantarum can go up a little bit higher, but most lactose cannot survive over four IBU. And I mean, that's literally like taking a hot pellet and chucking it in there. So just don't, you don't need it in these. Although, I mean, it, it's not bad to have it in there, but if you make a gosa right, yeah, you don't need it. You don't need hops at all. Uh, the technical IBUs say between five and twelve. Honestly, you're not going to know the difference between five IBUs and zero IBUs. So yeah. I don't. I also don't use hops in my gozas. Um, favorite yeast to use? You have to use an acid tolerant yeast. Um, yeah. So I'm going to throw out two. Again, I'm not super concerned with yeast, other than that I like that nice German flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, but German ale is going to be the classic acid tolerant top cropping hardy hazy strain uh, i'm also going to throw out so4 so4 is acid tolerant and it's super tasty uh <clears throat> yeah um and I, widely available and widely available my my favorite on there is definitely going to be the german ale yeast uh, i would also throw in kolsch yeast uh, i absolutely love that i think we use 3470 generally yeah uh, in ours um I love all of those because they're going to give you that, you know, little bit of uh, palm fruit flavor going in there. Um, I think the the British, my one problem with the British ale is I think it might go a little bit bready for my own personal taste. But that is a great substitute for it. If you have British ale on hand, that'll make a pretty darn good gosa. Super uh, available as well. Um, There was somebody who asked, is there a good all around substitute for carapils? And then the very next comment completely answered it how I would answer it, which is chit. Yeah. Chit is the best carapil substitute. Chit is like, it gives you everything in a Pilsner malt that you want. It gives you some proteininess 
and it gives you all the body and head retention from hair carapils without just being here's a bunch of maltodextrin in your beer style malt so chit is the right answer uh yeah all around is the right answer i would say up into a point and i would switch over to uh some caramel pills uh yeah if you need but... any sort of sweetness and color in the beer caramel pills is a uh eight to eleven level bond um similar to carahel has a lot of those same bodybuilding qualities as uh carapils but has that light almost honey like sweetness yeah uh, so those are some really, really great substitutes in there. Uh, Thomas Biha, using Quike or Lutra. Uh, Lutra would uh, probably be a little bit too clean in Agosa. Um, you want a little bit of that palm character coming out. You want a little bit of yeast character coming out of this. I would, don't think it would be inappropriate, and I think you can make a, a great beer coming out of that, but you would lose a little bit. Uh, other Quike yeast, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. it, it wouldn't have the same traditional Gosa character out of it, but it could be really interesting. That's the bottom line. It's going to be, it, it, it's going to make a good beer, but it's not going to be. Go get some mail. Oh, what's that? Uh, what's the song from Blues Clues? Mail time, mail time. Something like that. <laughs> All right. Well, he's grabbing some mail. Let's go ahead and jump on to our topic. Number one, hopefully why a lot of you guys tuned in. Um, this is a super interesting topic and it's a under misunderstood topic by a lot of people. And that is what different water minerals add to your beer. So you've all seen some water chemistry, uh, breakdowns. Basically you're going for a certain style of beer and they say, because of where this was made historically, these are the minerals that you want, but why? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what each mineral adds to your beer and why it is used. Um, and we're going to, I just kind of layered this out how you usually see it when you talk, talk, talk about, out, talk about mineral breakdowns. Um, starting with calcium. Got myself too close. Mine. Unboxing video? Yeah. What are we unboxing? I don't know. Something from uh, Mist King. Oh, is this beer from somebody? Uh, what if we maybe. got beer mail during a live stream? We would have to drink it. I mean, I think that's a requirement. <laughs> All right, calcium. Um, what what questions do you guys have about calcium while we're unboxing this uh, this beer mail? Uh, oh no, never mind. It's a uh, photo emulsion. Screen printing stuff. All womp right. womp. All right. All right, so calcium, for those of you guys who don't know, it kind of has a couple different purposes, the most common of which I think people understand to be um, that calcium is a good clarifier. High calcium in your water means it's going to be easier for your yeast to flocculate and easier for your beer to clarify. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is a distraction. I'm going to take a moment uh, to say something in here. This is a point in Gosas, and especially dealing with lactobacillus, this is a point that IBUs actually do matter because of their antibacterial properties, not any flavor connotation. All right. So calcium, yeast food, it uh, helps flocking. Yes. Um, uh, calcium also serves to be yeast food. It's very important for uh, yeast metabolism. Um, if you don't have some level of calcium, then your yeast will suffer. Um, they'll have to basically eat themselves to be able to metabolize your beer. So some level of calcium is always important. Uh, what's more important is the ratio of calcium to magnesium. So magnesium. Magnesium is going to be present in grain, but again, it, it's uh, pretty important the ratio of calcium to magnesium in about a one to five ratio, one being the magnesium, five being the calcium. So if you see calcium at um, 100 parts per million, for example, your magnesium can be a little bit less than 20 parts per million because some of it's gonna come from grain. Um, but uh, let's say your calcium is 300 parts per million, you're not gonna get that much magnesium from your grain. So you're gonna wanna make sure that that magnesium is up in the, whatever one fifth 60 50 parts per million something like that so you're gonna get some from grain but not a lot so that's a, a good thing to kind of denote when you're looking at your calcium to magnesium ratio um other than that magnesium that i know of doesn't offer a lot in terms of uh flavor in beer but it's uh, it is an important thing to think about when it comes to the yeast but what does magnesium do for people uh it makes you sleep better well no it's a salt. 
Oh yeah, Epsom salt. So we were talking about that uh, earlier. Electrolytes. Uh, oh yeah, Epsom salt is an electrolyte. You add that in there, and technically, uh, it can help rehydrate you at certain levels. Raise your hand if you guys want to know the definition of electrolytes and what they actually do inside your body, because uh, we can we can uh, we can go over that. Um, it's pretty interesting. I took phys phys physical chemistry for a long time, so. Yeah, oh, damn it! I got him distracted. Sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, Sodium. Sodium. Here's the first fun one. So sodium is a, <laughs> is a way, way under recognized mineral that I've seen people looking at in recipes. I use sodium a lot more than a lot of people do. Um, let's take, for example, hazy IPAs. Whenever I see people balancing their uh, sulfates to chlorides and hazy IPAs, I see them using calcium chloride as their number one, how they get their chlorides in their beer. And I don't like that. Um, I use a good amount of sodium. I want to get in my hazy IPAs, I want to get between 30 and 40 parts per million of sodium. Um, and so I use a lot of sea salts. Yeah. Uh, and there's a reason for that as well. It's what sodium adds, especially in hazy IPAs. Of course, getting uh, all of your water salts balanced out is a really good thing. But if you don't use sodium, oh, sorry, it's not even that. If you uh, use sodium on there, it adds some extra perceived mouthfeel and sweetness to the beer. It really helps out that fluffy puffiness uh, in your hazy IPAs. Yeah, and it's it's the better raw per sweet uh, raw mineral for perceived sweetness um, compared to chloride, which we'll, which we'll also talk about in a second. Um, but it actually. Um, what sodium does is it uh, lowers the energy of activation for your palate. And so basically anything that your palate's going to naturally be tasting, it lowers the energy of activation for your taste buds to actually receive that flavor information. And so it intensifies flavor. Why do I think this is important in hazy IPAs? Because hazy IPAs are super flavorful beers. They're super important to get all those juicy, sweet flavors from the hops, um, you know, bouncing off your tongue and making you perceive all those. And so I love having a certain degree of sodium and uh, and not just using calcium chloride for that yeah you know it's always better the more you can taste it exactly one thing it also does too is smoothness it makes these beers really easy and uh you know we did talk about uh the mouthfeel in there but the smoothness creaminess that's in your mouth on that just makes beers with a little bit higher sodium in there very very pleasant to drink yeah it's a big texture um texture i, I want to say texture surprise but that just makes me think <laughs> of hunter hunter you're right he's yeah. like texture surprise yeah there we go <laughs> Um, uh, let's talk about the, the chloride. Chloride, so sodium and chloride obviously go well together. Um, they're both used in the Goza, and there's a reason that having that high salt content makes Goza for such a light and sessionable beer, mm -hmm. also such an incredibly flavorful beer. Yeah, and one big thing about it also, uh, going into the uh, smoothness and creaminess on the uh, sodium, there's a reason that Goza still being super dry tastes creamy and full in your mouth. Yeah. And it's because because of the high salt content naturally in the ground and in the water around Gosler. Yeah, and Tim loves a mouthful of creaminess, oh, and so that's man. super important. It is super important. Joel, thank you for the super chat. I'm only yeah. starting, started a brewery a couple months ago, and thanks to you, I slowly but steadily improve my knowledge slash skills every week, and I wanted to say thanks for educating all of us. Highly appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. We appreciate the super chat. That is yeah. awesome. I always love it to hear when, especially when people are starting breweries, I always love to hear that like, hey, by the way, you guys are helping us, helping us experiment and be successful. That's super fun. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get back on to, so, to chloride. So chloride, chloride does add to the mouthfeel um, and it adds to the texture of beer. Again, adding to that creaminess and full bodiedness. Um, like Tim was saying, uh, that full bodiedness, a lot of it comes from the water minerals, not necessarily from, because this beer finishes out at 10.06. Um, mm -hmm. so having that high sodium and chloride content really adds to the fullness of it and makes it so you can perceive the flavors a lot more for a relatively simple and light beer. But chloride also, uh, pushes forward sweetness in a different way than sodium does. And it pushes forward. It has, it has a heavier malt similar flavor. So a flavor similar to malt that makes you perceive sweetness better from the malt. And so it pushes forward any malt flavors. So the ni nice light graininess that you get off of something like torrified wheat or a good Pilsner malt is intensified uh, by having a little bit of chloride in there. Yeah. So it's nice and delicious. While it gives you that big mouthfeel and adds to some sweetness, it's going to hit on the hot or sorry, going to hit on the malts a lot more in that sweetness. So that you know that's something important to have in there definitely 
Um, John Booth, how much bath salts can you add to... Oh, I misread Until that. Until you start eating your friends. Yeah, if you if you take a bite out of somebody's cheek, you've added too much bath salts. <laughs> <laughs> Far too much. All right, let's go on to uh, sulfate. And a lot of you have heard of chloride and sulfate and kind of here's how you use that ratio, chlorides and sulfates. Um, uh, so where chloride adds sweetness and maltiness, sulfates add uh, sharpness and brightness. Uh, one second. Uh, Kevin, any water testing kits you suggest? call your local water supply uh whoever you pay your bills to uh, is normally required to have a water break dependent well at least you know in the u.s is required to have a water breakdown of what's in the water that they are sending to your house uh so that's a great place to go go to your water supplier ask for uh, the mineral breakdown and they will give it to you sorry SL4, getting into that sharpness, brightness, pronounces hops, tastes minerally. So uh, sharp and bright, kind of uh, what that means is very, very high peaked notes in there of what you're coming from, as well as brightness is very bright, very forward, no muted flavors going on in that. Uh, and that's something that's uh, kind of important to go into, uh, you know, IPAs, like hazy yeah. IPAs. Yeah, and so a little bit of, uh, of, of sulfates. You see hazy IPAs having both sulfate and chloride, and a lot of people focus on the ratio. I think that's a good kind of average to go with is the ratio of sulfates to chlorides, um, but actually the raw amounts is pretty important too. So mm -hmm. something like a hazy IPA, you can see anywhere between 300 parts per million of chloride and 60 parts per million of sulfate. That's still enough sulfate that you're getting big sharpness off of the hops. Um, but you're also getting that big, rich flavor off of the chlorides. Uh, and again, for me, I like my, my, my sodium parts per million around 60 parts per million in my hazies. Um, you don't need that much. You can get a really, really good hazy, and a lot of ours actually fall somewhere in the 80 to 120 parts per million of chloride and somewhere between 20 and 40 parts per million of sulfate. But sometimes if we're adding so much juiciness to our hops and also getting that sodium in there, um, then we really don't want to uh, totally flavor bomb that. And so you'll, you'll see kind of both ends of the spectrum. But even if the chlorides are super, super high, you're still getting flavor benefits off the sulfates. Um, so it's a combination. It's not just the ratio. It's also the, the amounts of each. Um, yeah. Uh, and what, like Peter's talking about in there, uh, this helps enhance the hoppiness of it and the sharpness of the hops. So what th that really means is this is bringing out the pungent in your face flavors of hops on, yeah. on there instead of the nice soft juicy flavors that you can get out of something that like you know sodium yeah um so sulfates are going to be really important in west coast ipas obviously that's a, a really big one where you can have that 200 to 300 parts per million of sulfates um they're also really important in a lot of english styles mm -hmm. so uh, i think esbs um pale ales anything like that definitely uh in there so yeah and, and a, a mineralic taste to it i mean it's one of those things where if you taste a purified water that has minerals added to it and you can kind of taste the minerals in there uh that's the flavor that's coming out of it and i would also say it's almost a little bit gritty in high proportions yeah uh it almost like it's hard to describe it's not quite sand but it almost has a feeling in there it's one of those i call it like a it, it's one of the things that adds to a minerally feeling beer and it's it's one of those it's almost tongue scrapey it's like why is my tongue so mm, i need to do that sandpapery yeah yeah so sulfate's kind of an interesting one in that one it has a feel as well as a flavor and it def, does pronounce uh pronounce hops um uh, bicarbonate is the uh, is the last kind of common one that you see, and bicarbonate's an interesting one because there's a, a large school of people out there that just don't think about how much bicarb bicarbonate is in any, in any of their beer. Um, they don't consider it a flavoring mineral, and because bicarbonate actually changes a lot from what you get in your water profile to what you get in your final beer for a couple of reasons. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, who was talking about that? Yeast and the Beast was talking about a uh, pretzel stout. Uh, oh, yeah. earlier this would be something to go a little bit heavy on if you're trying to do that is the bicarbonate where pretzels get most of their flavor from is the uh, baking soda or 
sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. Uh, and that's the really nice pretzel flavor. So if you want to mimic something like that in beer, adding this in in a higher amount would definitely be the way to do it. Uh, or if you want to make really good pretzels, you boil the dough in sodium bicarbonate water. Yeah, it's one, delicious. One thing that I noticed in beer, let's say you're making a, uh, a Pilsner, is probably a good way to kind of, a Pilsner is probably the best way to understand what your water does for your beer um, or try out different water profiles. Something super, super light with a little bit of hops in them um, is probably the best way to do that. But uh, from my experiments with using bicarbonate in Pilsners, it does change the, the texture of the final beer. And it mm. does get, I call it a rocky texture, like a rocky minerality. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's got a little bit of that extra... Uh, a little bit of that extra sharpness. The bubbles are more impactful. That, that might be the best way to, yeah. to, to put it. Uh, and, you know, going on these two, the minerality that we've been talking about for these last two things, uh, if you want to really experience this, it would be getting a nice, fine, traditionally made Pilsner and then drinking it next to a really good Dortmunder. Uh, this is one of the big things that separates these two beers is the super high mineral content in a Dortmunder export. And you can almost feel the minerals inside of it. Uh, we just had a delicious one from Lupulin Brewing the other day. And if you're listening Lupulin or anybody close to them, send us more Lupulin. There, there's your daily quota for sending us beer. Send us beer. Bump, bump, uh, bump. Is 300 parts per million too much, I'm guessing, for bicarbonate? Uh, no, not really. Kind of depends. Yeah. So um, that that's a great experiment that you can do at home, grabbing some of these, tasting them next to each other, because you will really get that impactfulness of the minerality of it. Um, there's a couple of great questions that I've seen mm. already, but I also want to go over... Um, Something that we haven't really touched on with these, we've been going mostly over flavor, uh, but bicarbonate also adds uh, alkalinity, so the opposite of acidity to your beer, meaning if you have a high bicarbonate content, it is important to add some sort of acid, and I prefer to do this in mash, not in water for a specific reason, um, uh, but it is important to have some level of acidity to balance it out so your mash pH comes in at that 5.2 pH range. Um, let's go into bicarbonate and why it's an interesting one, because the amount of bicarbonate in your water is rarely the amount of bicarbonate that you get in your final beer uh, for two reasons. One, well, for one reason, and that's precipitation. But precipitation happens for two reasons. Uh, when water with high calcium or with some calcium and high bicarbonate yeah, mm. um, uh, is heated up, uh, it forces precipitation of uh, uh, calcium bicarbonate. And uh, they, that settles out of the beer. So that wa doesn't actually end up, or settles out of the water, so it doesn't actually end up in your beer. Um, that also happens with increased acidity. So if you are acidifying your water, your strike water, for example, before it goes into the mash, if you're acidifying that water and heating it up, you're actually going to end up with a lot of white dots in the bottom of your kettle. And that's a lot of that bicarbonate and some of that calcium precipitating out. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. So that's an important thing to think about. <coughs> Bless me. Uh, calcium specifically does uh, sort of the opposite. So whereas uh, bicarbonate adds raw alkalinity, um, calcium, by nature, how it can precipitate with bicarbonate, um, actually reduces what's called the residual alkalinity. And so if there's a natural buffering that happens with water minerals that are in in your water going into your beer, calcium will actually make your water more susceptible to pH change. Um, uh, it's going to prevent your water from naturally buffering against pH change. So uh, having some level of calcium reduces your residual alkalinity, meaning that the natural acidity that comes from your malts will change your mash pH, mash pH more. Hopefully that made some sense. Uh, let's get into some of the questions that I've seen because there's some really great questions. Well, uh, adding the minerals. I like this one. When do you add minerals and why? Um, I add all my minerals to the mash usually because the fact that there is sugar additions and uh, sugar from the, um, from the mash uh, makes it more consistent that uh, that the minerals will end up in your beer. So if you're adding it to the water, for the example that I just gave, especially if it's just strike water and it's already heated up, um, there's a chance that some of that is just going to form chalk or some minerality. Um, there's also usually less... Uh, um, movement of the water in the sh if it's strike water, for example. Um, and so that can naturally adjust against the minerals that you use. So I like to add it in the mash. You've got an hour for that to, dis to dissolve. You've got sugar that's in there kind of helping it dissolve. Um, and it's more consistent than if you were adding it to your strike or sparge water. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Uh, what was the other one? Magnesium and calcium. Are they in yeast nutrient? Um, some yeast nutrients magnesium is in. Very few. I don't know of any that calcium is in specifically. Um, A lot of yeast nutrients actually end up being dead yeast cells because that carries most of the yeast or most of the nutrients that yeast need to live. Um, there are other things that are added in there, but generally something uh, like calcium probably not because of how much that could change your beer here's a fun one how should salt additions scale as gravity gets higher and that's kind of an interesting two-part question um in general if you if you have a target salt complex that you want um then the salt additions should dilute as gravity scales because you're actually adding more overall water. So your salt additions are usually calculated by total water and that water is going to be condensed more um, with larger batches of beer. But that doesn't necessarily apply for some high gravity beers because some, some high gravity beers were designed off of a certain water profile, but had that same water profile throughout all their water and so it doesn't scale inversely like that. So. Uh, that's a it's a tough question if it's an english style beer then probably just keep the water profile the same and scale your water proportionally with the gravity if it's any other style of beer that you're making imperial imperial pilsner for example decrease your um your overall mineral load per unit of water so you can keep your final water profile the same hopefully that made some sort of sense thomas new beer uh, on here is they didn't label it as good as i hoped uh, blood apri pale. Um, so I'm assuming uh, blood orange apricot pale ale. Maybe. Oh yeah, this was dropped off um, by the dude who uh, works at Snap On. He's got the you know the, the tools. Oh yeah. yeah he's yeah. one of our humbers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I was the one that wrote that on the on the lid. Oh well, there we go. I forget his name. I wish I did, but yeah, he's a, a he's a new home brewer um, doing all grain buying some really nice uh nice stuff but he's i want to see he only brewed like two or three batches first batch is a complete fail and this one he really enjoyed and was a, was a success so well it's good that he enjoys it yeah, yeah. um so yeah um the blood orange and apricot's really nice actually that there's a lot of good flavors going on there this is an overly bittered beer it is uh, extremely bitter. You know, I was talking to him about uh, where he moved his hops into, uh, and he said he moved what was going to be his dry hops into a boil edition. So I think that's what happened. Um, Do it, wait. Marte, thank you for the super chat. Coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm reading as a cheers, so I'm cheersing you. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, oh, the- wait, wait. Are we? What are we doing? What no, are you? What it are looks you- good. Okay. It looked like, uh, well, Daniel said network problems, and it looked like we were jumping on my phone. So, oh, gotcha. Okay. Looks like we're good. So the uh, the blood orange and the apricot on this are really good, and they actually serve to um, uh, downplay the over aggressive bitterness that's in this. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, there's a lot of bitterness in this from the hops being added too early on. Um, but I would say for you know. An early on brew. This is pretty decent. I probably I drink this. Pretty decent. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not enjoying the nose. I will say that. Uh, yeah, the nose the is a little bit sweet, mixed with IPA, which is a little bit, yeah. a little bit weird. But hey, you know it's great. He's a new brewer and he's uh, not producing uh, infected beer, so that's awesome. Yeah, I would uh, honestly if. If it weren't for the overly aggressive bitterness, I'd be drinking this a lot faster. And I think it's totally fine. Mm. I would definitely. It's definitely coming out more now in the back end. Yeah, I think the fact that there's. I think if this did not have the blood orange and the apricot, I think this beer would be hard for me to drink. But the fact that that's there to kind of offset, offset. The, the aggressive bitterness, I think it's. Yeah. That's, that's pretty darn good. All right. MSG as sea salt or as a salt. That's a tough one. Um, I don't know so glutamate would probably turn into glutamic acid sometime in the mash so the sodium would work i have no idea what the glutamic acid slash glutamate would do i think if you're using msg uh for a gosa you could make it work but it would be an entirely different beer if you needed an umami beer i could see that being the yeah 
Um, ooh, this is actually a very off-topic question, but uh, tips for adding sweetness to apple, apple cider. Um, it's one of the best ways is stop it before the fermentation is done and leave some residual sweetness. The other one is to kill off the yeast and then back sweeten with whatever kind of sweetness you want. And if you're bottling, the only way is to add stevia or monk fruit sugar. Do add a unfermentable sugar that um, the yeast won't attack and eat and cause bottle bombs. Uh, if you have the ability to, uh, who is this, uh, Hans? Uh, Hunnis, I'm not saying that right, but uh, the only way, if you don't have a way to force carbonate, the only way to add sweetness is to use an unfermentable sugar. Monk fruit is a great one because it doesn't taste fake. First edition hops to the boil to bring out a smoother bitterness. Um, is that you mean like first war hopping? First war hopping. I have never noticed a major difference between first wart hopping and early boil additions, if I'm being honest. Uh, I will say that once I started uh, on my homebrew system, uh, because I could chill really quickly, once I started doing first wart hopping, I kept doing it. Uh, I, it could just be me. I thought it added a little bit uh, smoother bitterness and less sharp bitterness to it, but that could all honestly be a perception. Uh, I would say first wort hopping is probably something more along the lines of, do you want to do that or not? Like preference. Yeah. And mash hopping is just weird. Um, some people mash hop and I don't. We've mashed up. Yeah, I know. I just don't like it for I don't like it for two things. I don't think it adds a ton to your beer. And then I also don't like it because if you're getting rid of your grains to cows, hops are really bad for them to eat. Yeah. So that also is true. Uh practically speaking, they're not very good. Yeah. I think we got more uh hopping the sparking water. That's what yeah, we that's, did yeah, our that's, six day IPA. Yeah, if you yeah, if you're hopping the yeah, if you're hopping the sparge water, that's that's completely different. But yeah. actually throwing the hops in into the mash, nah. 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 Let's go on to our second topic real quick and see if we can get through this. We skipped it last week. So let's talk about how to scale beer recipes. Um, and this is either if you're grabbing a giant recipe from a brewer um, that brews on a commercial scale and scaling it down to your homebrew scale, or if you're on your homebrew scale and you want to scale up, just some guidelines to help with that um, to make it easier for you to you know, get your large batch, batch recipes kind of in play. Um, the first thing that, that I want to say uh, for the sake of your local homebrew supply store, if you are scaling down from a large batch and you're using the calculator to scale down, please round your additions, malt, hops, whatever. Because if I start seeing some, you know, 0 0.0375821 ounce additions on a homebrew recipe, I immediately don't take it seriously and I, 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 I get mad. I don't like it. It's frustrating to see that. While it may be something... This is something that if you want to do that, get yourself a scale, buy an ounce of hops, and weigh it out yourself. Uh, for it, it, it's very, very frustrating to see that in the homebrew shop world, mainly because that much of a hop in that much of a uh, small container just doesn't matter. You know what that difference is? It's literally like a crumble of a pellet. Yeah, I, it, it's one of those things that you saw it on. It, I can't, I can't say this. I'm getting on a soapbox right here. I know I am. I can feel it coming. Like I'm setting it down on the ground, starting to step up on. But basically, what it says to us is that you're not understanding what your beer is doing. You're just copying and scaling a recipe. And when you're scaling it, because so much stuff is different you should be changing these amounts. It is not direct. It is not a one-to-one. -one. These things should be changing. And it's frustrating to see people think, oh, I'm gonna make a great beer by cutting this in half. I'm like, well, no, no. Um, and that kind of leads into one of our, uh, our, one of our next points is understanding um, how many things actually change when going from a large scale to a small scale and vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, a great example when it comes to hops or even hop utilization, the boiling temperature actually increases the larger your boiling vessel 
if you think about it, the boiling, the average boiling temperature is a combination of, is a stratification of the boiling temperature. Um, was it in a, it's an average of the boiling temperature across the entire kettle and boil, uh, water at higher pressure boils at a higher temperature. Uh, obviously the larger your kettle, the more pressure is going to be on the bottom of your kettle, which means that, uh, the water that's at the lower half of your giant boiling kettle is actually hotter than the boiling temperature at the top of your boiling kettle and the bigger your kettle, the bigger that difference. And on average, that means your boiling temperature is higher. So uh, if you are scaling up to a big scale, you're getting a higher boiling temperature, which is going to change your rate of alpha acid isomerization. It's going to change your, your rate of um, uh, volatilization of hop oils. A lot of things happen on that bigger scale. And so there's a, you need to take that into account based on size. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, actually, no bring, uh, bringing something up. If you are going with obscenely small amounts of hops, please give it to somebody in grams and not ounces. It is so much easier to weigh out tiny amounts in grams than ounces because it breaks down better. Yeah. But what to basically unscientify what Peter is saying, if you have a larger amount, there's more weight pressing down on it, which creates more pressure. So the boiling temperature is higher. Just like if you boil something in Death Valley, it boils much hotter than if you boil it up at the top of uh, Mount Everest. So a bigger vessel means more pressure, which means a hotter boil, but it also changes the way that other things interact in there. Uh, all of your molecules are gonna be forced to come together a little bit more if there's higher pressure into it, because it's harder to move through than a less pressured liquid. Reason number 212, why clone recipes are dumb. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, that is one of the reasons why you can't, <clears throat> you can make a beer that tastes Your remarkably at, similar, yeah. but not exactly the same as somebody uh, else because you don't have the uh, equipment and this actually changes. Let's talk right. about something else that goes into, um, larger size batches. So larger size batches usually also have a chilling time differential, meaning, uh, if you're on the homebrew scale, you're using a giant immersion chiller, then that giant immersion chiller can usually chill your homebrew size batch down in, let's say, 10, 12 minutes, um, kind of depending. Um, that has a huge play in something that happens with the hops and the rate of uh, evaporation of uh, aromatic hop oils. So when you are um, on a homebrew scale, it is much easier if you're doing like a five minute addition or a flame out addition to trap aromatic hop oils if you can chill down super fast. But as you scale up and chilling down quickly um, becomes more of a challenge, then you have to usually rely on some ancillary methods such as a hop stand, a whirlpool, um, or some sort of closed system transfer whereby you're transferring your wort through your hops um, to infuse all those oils in a way that's going to make them stay inside the beer. Matt, uh I don't know if you hit on it, but it's a lot easier to chill down five gallons for a whirlpool edition than it is 220. That happens a lot faster. Um, so because of that, you have to shift things around. Another reason why clone brews are not exactly something that you can do. If you make one of our uh, seven barrel IPAs, we add our bittering edition in with 20 minutes left into the boil. Yep. because it takes us that long to cool it down to whirlpool levels. When we add giant flavor additions to our hops, that usually means that our hop, that our, our wort is going to spend a little bit of time whirlpooling, um, cooling down below boiling temperatures so as to not uh, evaporate out those oils, and then we're sending it through some sort of a hop back to sh infuse all that hop flavor. So, Yeah. All right. Uh, larger ferments. This is a huge thing on scaling and what the actual size of your fermenter does for you. Um, yeah. We don't make lagers on any of our small tanks because they just don't perform as well as our big tanks. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on on that, on that large scale. And part of that has to do with the actual pressure, the partial pressure on the system. Um, pressure actually will help those lagers to clarify over time. And so if we're brewing a lager, we brew it on our seven barrel system because it's got more partial pressure on it, even without pressure fermentation. Um, that pressure coming from actual physical weight, for whatever reason, uh, seems to help that lager clarify and naturally ferment as a true bottom fermenting uh, yeast. And so when we're doing that on the seven barrel system, we find good, clean, consistent results. 
uh, and the beer always tastes better than if we're doing it on the small system. If you're doing it on the small system, you kind of have to pressure ferment or try to faux make the lager the same way you would on the large scale. But lagers were designed to be large batch beers. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and it was just the way they developed. Uh, Carlsberg Brewery had the first lager in the world, and they literally discovered it because they shoved their beer in giant vats into a cave because it stored better. So this yeast developed making big batches of beers and absolutely loves that high, high pressure pushing down on it. Yeah, and you got to think, especially if you're doing something like a carboy with an airlock or carboy with a blow-off tube, dispend, uh, dis depending on um, the size of your actual liquid volume versus the size of your headspace, um, you're relatively open fermenting a lot of your beers. So there's going to be a natural fruitiness that comes from a lot of your fermentations unless you're pressure fermenting. Uh, so that's something to think about when uh, it's going to be a natural difference between even if I was open fermenting, you know, a seven barrel vertical tank batch, I'm going to get a pseudo pressure fermentation just because of the partial pressures on the system versus if I am uh, doing the same kind of open style fermentation on a carboy, the pressures are going to be a lot different and I'm going to get more of an open fermentation style. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's one of the big, uh, big things out there. Why you can't do a cl clone brew as well. It's really hard to replicate these environments without actually having it. Yeah. Um, each new system, basically what we're trying to say is each new system has its pitfalls. Uh, it has, uh, it has its uniquenesses. And so understanding where those squeeze points can be, um, squeeze point being something like time to chill squeeze point being like how your chiller works, uh, is your chiller working where if it's a, a counter flow chiller, for example, or a plate chiller where you've got half your beer staying at boiling hot temperature where your hops are and the other, other half of your beer you know, in transit, cooling down in line, that works a lot differently than something like an immersion chiller, where all of your beer is chilling down simultaneously and you can infuse hops at different temperatures that way. So uh, we like to, on this system, do a little bit of a combined. We have a, a counter flow chiller and we run our beer through that and back into the beer um, for our whirlpool. And so we can reduce the temperature of the entire system to do like a hop stand or a whirlpool addition. Um, but understanding those squeeze points and the differences between your system is a good way to um, start to troubleshoot how to scale. And a good starting point is just scaling linearly. So if you have, if you're doing a 15 gallon batch and you want to do a five gallon batch, divide everything by three, but then look at those squeeze points. Say, I know my chill time is going to be longer, so I'm going to take my hops and I'm going to move them closer to the end of the boil. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, or if you know that you're fermenting more and there's going to be more pressure on it, which is going to act like a colder fermentation, allowing it to go up to a little bit warmer temperature to uh, counteract that. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I have mostly on scaling. Let's get to a couple of questions. And if you, if there's anything that we went over too fast or if we went over incorrectly or um, that you got questions on, if we were ambiguous about anything, let us know. Uh, Thomas, this is actually a big thing, and you would be very surprised about the answer to this. I uh, heard that, in, uh, that bottom fermentation yeast work best in flat tanks, not coned ones. And this isn't just bottom fermentation yeast. Most yeast will ferment better in a flat bottom tank than a cone. Uh, the reason that big brewers love to use cone is the speed of the brew that comes out of it. Yeah, it helps it fine out easily, and so you can get that beer brighted and turned into a, um, into a kegged batch very, very quick. Um, this also is different based on scale. Uh, on the homebrew scale, probably not going to matter. Don't worry about getting a flat bottom tank. There's not enough pressure because there's not enough weight on the bottom of your cone. On a large scale batch, let's say seven barrels or higher, um, it's going to start making a difference. Uh, honestly, the the size starts making a big difference around that 15 barrel size where mm -hmm. 15 barrel horizontal tanks are way different than 15 barrel vertical tanks. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that developed because of commercialism rather than actual tastiness of the beer. Yeah. We just figured out how to, you know, make good beer coming out of it while also pleasing the accountants. Um, Jimmy J, what temperature does DMS convert to SMM and what safe temperature, what is a safe temperature uh, for a Pilsner based raw ale? Does the amount of modification matter in this case? Uh, multi parts to that. Uh, it's actually the other way around. SMM converts to DMS. 
Um, and uh, for the most part, a lot of highly modified malts um, uh, have a low enough degree of SMM uh, that is actually converted to DMS and volatilized during kilning. So if you get a really nice, let's say, um, like what we carry best malts, Pilsner malts, the, uh, there's going to be little to no, definitely below the flavor threshold of SMM. Um, and what was in there at the beginning of the grain was probably already converted to DMS during kilning, even though Pilsner malt is very, very lightly kilned and, uh, it's already volatilized. And that does have to do with degree of modification. Ryan, why is Ryan calling me? I don't know. Why are um, you calling me? Here's a good one. Nocturnal brewer, uh, plate chillers yeah. versus coil counterflow chillers versus immersion chillers, pros and cons. Uh, I'll just kind of hit quick on this. There's some more in there. So plate chillers, biggest con about a plate chiller is cleaning. If you get anything in there, any buildups, things like that, because okay. the plates are so tightly next to each other, these can clog real easy. Sure. They um, do happen to be the most the efficient. Thing. They can literally chill down almost instantly on anything in there. Sorry, I'm getting halfway distracted right. by this. Uh, they are the most uh, heat efficient or heat exchange efficient out of all the three, but they are the most prone to clogging on that. Uh, coil counterflow. Uh, this is a great marriage between uh, <laughs> utility as well as quickness and chilling. They chill down pretty darn fast. That's what we use here. But they still allow enough room in there that if you get you know whole leaf hops or protein coagulations or a whole bunch of pellets in there, they generally don't clog. Uh, immersion chillers. These things don't clog because you're running water through it and you just shove it into your beer. Now there's the con on it. You shove it into your beer, so do it while it's still hot to sterilize it. But it also heats down the most unevenly out of them all and the most inefficient because it's like having an ice cube in there instead of just constantly flowing over cold water. Yeah, I will say it is the immersion chillers are the easiest to, con to be consistent with on the small scale, the easiest to use on the small scale. Um, but yeah, when it gets there, they're just impractical on the large scale and they don't, uh, mm -hmm. um, they don't have the same efficacy. There's, there's bigger, there's other things that we do with beer on the large scale that makes immersion chillers impossible to use. Pretty much. Yeah. On a homebrew scale, immersion chillers are pretty darn awesome on that. It's one of the best ways to keep your beer nice and sterile and clean. Um, I'm not a fan of plate chillers because of how easy they can clog and, uh, clog yeah. yeah how easy mm -hmm. they can clog and, and how uh, how little how, people actually know that they should be cleaning them as often as they should yeah and as well as they should so ha caustic um michael galvin hey tim and peter just started home brewing a few months ago and appreciate all the knowledge you guys give and answering those burning questions you guys are really doing something big here cheers thank you michael gavin we appreciate you saying that we do did you already do will what willows willows mm, uh, 10 gallon batch yeah. Split batch, same yeast, different hops, but one batch has a metallic flavor. Any idea how to clear up this flavor? Metallic can be a lot of things that can actually come from certain bacterial infections. So uh, it's hard to say without tasting it myself and kind of getting a better pinpoint on where that flavor is actually coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be an infection, could be some malt oxidation uh, that happened in there, but you know, to, uh, take it to an expert. Um, yeah. thinking about bottling an IPA and I'm not oh, able yeah. to close transfer because of this. I'm bottling it early while backing off the priming sugar. How much should I take off? Uh, that's actually not a bad idea. Uh, depending on the yeast that you're using, I, and, and the headspace in the bottles, there's a couple things that go into this calculation. I would say with zero priming sugar, you're probably good to bottle with about eight points of expected gravity drop from where you expect final gravity to be. Again, if this is not a beer that you've done a lot of times and know exactly where that final gravity is going to be, it's really hard to say. Um, but that's about what you're looking at in, in natural condition bottling. Eight points into the bottle. Eight points. Uh, I'm going back through a few of them here. Uh, gentleman had, where was he? A little bit. That hits on the uh, minerals pretty well. Which one? Uh, Thomas on guitar. Oh, stopped using calcium sulfate because I got this really dry, nasty bitterness in my IPAs. Now I'm using chloride instead. Much smoother bitterness. Um, calcium sulfate can be weird in how it interacts with other flavor compounds too. So I'm going to say I'm probably not 100% equating that to the relationship of the calcium sulfate to the hops. And I'm 
probably more equating it the relationship to the sulfate specifically to some other component in the beer, i.e. Um, tannic astringentness from uh, uh, from the grains or some water source issues, the potential of chlorophenol. There's a lot of things that can make that calcium sulfate be a more aggressive um, grumpy guess. Yeah. Uh, this is going back here. Scott Crosby uh, said, and a couple of people talked about it, but Scott Co <clears throat> Crosby said, read an article a while ago that suggested w first wort hopping allows certain hop oils to dissolve into the wort at lower t uh, below boiling temperatures, forming an azeotrope uh, with water and preventing aromatic compounds from evaporating. Oh yeah, so that's I mean that's the, the the theory behind first wort hopping and substituting like a 20 minute addition. Again, very dependent on chill time with what would those you know 20 minute or 15 minute or 10 minute whatever those additions would be um, for first wort hopping instead of those. Um, but uh, again, I think very linearly with mine, and so I'm like, here's where I'm adding this flavor, here's where I'm adding this flavor, uh, and I want to eliminate variables. And so if I want extra juiciness from a lower temperature, I'm going to do a whirlpool hop instead and not risk the randomness of how, how much is uh, hardened into the beer basically before we go into a boiling, how much is going to volatilize during the boil. I'm just gonna throw it all in a whirlpool where I know it's not gonna volatilize and I'm not gonna have the, uh, the, the variable of an entire boil to worry about. Um, that's also what Daniel said. Uh, I happen to agree with that. If you're going for the flavor aroma, I would not use first wort hopping. Uh, like I said, when I did it, I found it to be a little bit smoother bitterness, but it was always bitterness while it was in there. That was always my bittering additions. Um, I think that can partly happen. I mean, it 100% does. You're putting hops in while the beer is still at lower temperatures and they can dissolve in better just like how Whirlpool goes. Uh, but then you're also boiling it, which means that you are boiling off some aromatics. Uh, no matter how well they are integrated in there, you're still boiling stuff off, uh, as well as converting some of those flavors into actual IBUs. You're converting AAs into uh, ISO AAs and creating bitterness out of it. So I would not use first wort hopping as a flavor aroma addition at all just as a bitterness addition but you know feel free to make the exact same beer just change it from first warp to six uh, first wart to uh you know your other additions uh send us both bottles and uh we'll tell you what we think greg h do you guys have any info on cellar science yeast i am fermenting a session pale with nectar uh I, we've used a handful of the cellar science yeast yes and i actually really like nectar i used that for a hazy ipa and thought it was delicious yeah uh, Lars just started using a hop rocket and mo noticed much less bitterness from filtering out the green matter. Uh, we, for our IPAs, uh, he also mentions that he misses that flavor a little bit. For our IPAs, we shove everything through a uh, hop rocket, through a hop back, and filter that all out. We want it to be smooth in there. If you're missing a little bit of it, go ahead and you know keep it in there, or maybe just add a little bit more bittering additions so you can get the hop bitterness rather than the green grassy bitterness. Favorite fruit addition to a goza? Pomegranate. Mm. Oh, I don't know about that. I am a huge, huge fan of cucumber. Uh, I think cucumber is phenomenal in something like a goza. For a 10 barrel batch of 1050 amount of dry yeast to use, to scale it up, amounts are all over the board, uh, all 500 grams. Any issues? Uh, depend For a 1050 batch, you're probably good with 500 gram pitchable. Um, that said, I wouldn't 100%. I, for a lot of batches uh, on 10 barrels, I would probably at least starter or um, pre-start the 500 gram pitchable. So I would, I would make some starter wort, throw like a barrel of it in the bottom of your 10 barrel fermenter. He's sitting in his car. Do the 500 gram pitchable, and then, uh, you know, then you've got started 500 grams instead of from dry 500 grams. All right, you close it out. Yeah, I'll get all right. anything. One more thing on that, Daniel. Uh, if you want it to be pickly, it definitely adds some uh, dill in there. But especially when you're fermenting out cucumbers, they end up being very, very sweet. And I love that about that. So uh, thank you, Lars. Awesome for the super chat. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Uh, smash that like button before you go. Go like all our social medias, both of our YouTube channels. You know what they are. They're linked in there. Get after it. And uh, cheers. Thank you, guys.